Uh, recently, I think somebody wants to fly away, man. First <laughs> um, Samuel, Old Testament, First Samuel, chapter thirty. Samuel chapter 30 and verse 1 and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein they slew not any either great or small but carried them away and went on their way so David and his men came to the city and behold it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, uh, Hinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Car Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us together this evening. We ask that you will be here in our midst, that you'd put me aside, that you'd speak uh, through your word to the people, to us. Lord, help us to be encouraged to the work ahead of us, and uh, we pray that you will be glorified and uh, lifted up in this service. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, it, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, when you think about all that's happened, and if you know this chapter, you know how it ends. It ends on a much more positive note than uh, where we're at in verse 6. But they were uh, looking at stoning David, if you caught that in the reading. Um, they're, uh, everybody's against him. Uh, they were blaming him for this great tragedy that was that had taken place in their lives, and uh, that's uh, it, it's human nature rising up, and, and David was taking the blame, and David's in a position where, I mean, he had suffered as much loss as everybody else, but he's also the one that's being pointed at as the scapegoat for uh, the, the the tragedy that has happened. This is a, a very tragic thing that happened at Ziklag. I mean, you look at verse one. And uh, you can imagine they saw the smoke in the distance and the, 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 the heart-sinking feeling they must have had. And they see the, the city where they knew their children were, their wives were, everything that they had, everything they lived for. And it was going up in smoke, literally. Going up in smoke and the, the feeling they must have had, the uh, disappointment, the, the heartache, uh, the, the, the fear even. And people just lost their minds. Uh, at this event, as you can imagine, everything they had going up in smoke, everything they lived for, everything they worked for, everything they invested their lives into, and uh, somebody had to take the blame. And you know, y you can see that in the world today, can you not? <laughs> um, people upset about this, upset about that. Somebody's got to take the blame, and they'll look to uh, a, uh, a leader, somebody in a position of leadership. Or maybe it's a politician, maybe it's a church leader, maybe it's a, a, a family leader. <laughs> Somebody's got to take the blame. And David was the man everybody was looking at. David's going to take the blame here. Look at verse 6. It says, And David was greatly distressed, and the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, if you back up in the story, back, uh, you know, we, we could go all the way back to David and Goliath. Um, but leading up to this, as you know, David was being chased by Saul in the wilderness, and he goes to Achish. Um, if you're familiar with the story, he goes to Achish. I think that's, uh, well, even before that, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. Let's go back to chapter 22. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. 
And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves together or gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. That's the beginning of David's army. Uh, by the time we're reading there in chapter 30, somewhere in, in this chapter, it says there's, there's 600 men. So David gets uh, 200 more after that, and David's building an army. They start in a cave. must have been a pretty big cave to have 400 men, but you'll notice they were in distress, discontented. They were in debt, and they went to David in the first place looking for something they didn't have, and they were discouraged to begin with. And now they come to Ziklag, and this is going to be David's fault now. Um, interesting, when you start to look at all that was happening in the chapters leading up to this, in chapter 27, Ziklag, the name of this town where uh, their families were, was a gift from Achish. It was the gift, chapter 27 and verse 4, And it was told Saul that David had, was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. So that's where Ziklag comes from. Um, David was being chased by Saul. As you know, David was the anointed king. He was rightfully king, but Saul was also anointed. And uh, David didn't want to lift a finger against uh, Saul. So he was just getting chased uh, around the wilderness by Saul. And he goes to Achish for help. He gives him the town of Ziklag. Achish takes him under his wing. Achish uh, makes some promises. Look at chapter 28. And verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that, that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. And he makes a, makes a promise. Surely you'll go out with me to battle and you'll be my... The keep, you'll keep my head, you'll be my protector, my bodyguard, my guardian forever. And that sounds uh, like flattery, like we were he hearing about earlier uh, today. That was your classic uh, flattery going on there. And uh, David was made a promise, which did not come through. Achish's promise there in chapter 28. And, you know, in, in chapter 29, he finds out in verse 3 that he could be faultless but not trusted. Uh, Achish even says something kind of like Pilate says about Jesus Christ. He says, I have found no fault in him at the end of verse 3. We'll read the whole verse. Then said the princes of the Philistines, what do these Hebrews here? 29 verse 3. And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel? which hath been with me these days or these years, and I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me this day. Um, he, uh, he, as a type of Christ even, David is there uh, faultless, but he still, Achish couldn't keep the promise even to a faultless man. Uh, David uh, did his best to be loyal, to be, to be without blame in the presence of Achish, and Achish is the one that made the promise. He didn't have to promise him that you'll be going to the battle with us, but he made the promise anyway, and then he didn't keep the promise. So David learned that one um, in chapter 29. Again, in uh, 29, verse 8 and 9, he found that he could be loyal without having his loyalty returned. In verse 8 and 9, it says, And David said to Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day? He's the one that said he was faultless. Uh, he's the one that made that uh, flattering claim and, of praise. And, uh, and David was uh, doing his best, but he says, I, what have I done? 
that I may not go to fight against the enemies of the, my lord, the king? Verse 9, And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Again, like the type of Christ. Uh, Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Nevertheless, the, the, the politicians, the leaders, whoever it is, uh, those in charge, the, the powers that be, are out there, and they won't let me. His uh, hands were tied. Maybe he had been uh, bought off, like political corruption. Uh, nevertheless, David learned some things. He couldn't, he couldn't trust any man, but that's what was leading up to this chapter. Now he comes to the burning town where his family was. Um, all that they were fighting for was now gone up in smoke. And uh, is after they had been rejected, he found that he could be loyal, but not, not have any loyalty returned. His own men start to blame him. I mean, I've been discouraged as a Christian. I've, I've uh, dealt with discouragement, but I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything that quite compares to what David was going through here. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And the end of verse 6 says, he and David encouraged himself in the Lord. In the, Lord. the more you think about that, it's, you, it's hard to wrap your mind around uh, what he's thinking, but he was able to somehow encourage himself in the Lord in a time, a struggle that most Christians never even come close to going through. David was able to come through and get victory by the end of the chapter. Uh, so I want to look at when someone is encouraged in the Lord, the signs of how you can tell if you are encouraged in the Lord. Uh, because, it, you know, I, I see these guys, they were, we saw them when they were discouraged and they went to the cave of Adullam and they found some qualities in David that they, they thought that's a man worth following. And they, they were, that's what they were when they were discouraged in the Lord. They went to the cave, they went to hiding, they went to the darkness, they went to find, went to look for, Somebody that might have some glimmer of hope in their darkness. That was David. That, that was these same men. Uh, I don't know how much earlier it was as a time frame, but th that was these guys. Now they, they see everything that they had going up in smoke. They're, they're losing it all. And uh, they have a different reaction. And they want to blame somebody. Their blood is boiling. They want revenge. They want to take somebody out. They want to fight. They, they're, they're looking for somebody to take the blame. And it's, it's David. He's the most obvious. You're the leader. I mean, the buck stops with you. You are in charge. You were responsible. You dropped the ball. I mean, most, I mean, if it's anything like Great Britain, they just step down as soon as people start to point the finger at them. Um, we just lost a uh, prime minister because he made a, a foolish law and it, backfired and people started blaming him for things we were talking about this earlier but um uh humza yusuf the muslim prime minister of scotland just stepped down because people start blaming him for things and that's that's typical that's expected even uh, of leaders of not just in great britain but almost any country it works this way you start taking the blame and everybody starts blaming you that's time to just quit time to quit time to step down that's that's discouragement, and David could have put an end to it. He could have, uh, he could have uh, been considering suicide like most people would do, people without the Lord, and even some Christians think that way. They get suicidal in their thoughts. They think that it's just time to quit. There's no reason to live anymore. Everybody's blaming me, and I'm not perfect, and what's life worth living anyway? It's just time to quit. <clears throat> uh, that's where David was. But he encouraged himself in the Lord. How do you suppose he did? You know, it has to do, I think, with... Um, it said he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And if we look back to the story of David and Goliath, uh, this isn't the first time he has had to do that. David took on Goliath. And if you'll turn there, chapter 17, verse 34, I also want to remind you of a verse in Romans 4, 18. It said the, about the faith of Abraham, who against hope, he believed in hope. That's, a, that's an amazing statement. In a hopeless situation, he just believed, I, you can't see any common sense way that this could turn out well. But since I believe in something called hope, I'm just going to 
go forth. <laughs> I'm just going to go forward because I believe in something called hope. <laughs> That's an amazing statement I find in the Bible. Who against hope believed in hope. Uh, all odds against him. Here's David, all odds against him. But it's not the first time this has happened. Against Goliath in chapter 17, verse 34, David, taking on the champion of the Philistines, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And David said, un, and Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David is not just re, reminding himself of the lion and the bear. He's reminding himself of how God delivered him out of the paw of the lion and the bear. Um, and now in chapter 30, David can say, God delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, and God delivered me out of the paw of the uh, Philistine, Goliath. And you, you see what I'm saying. David has a uh, experience building up where he can remind himself. He can go back to the filing cabinet of memory. And he can pull out the record where he can look back at what God has done in the past. And you all have experiences with the Lord. You all, if you've been saved any number of days even, you can point back to... Uh, victory after victory, times when God came through, and you, you still can't explain it, but you know God came through at this moment in your life, and you can go back to a point where God got you through something, uh, God uh, delivered you in some way, or came through with prayer, came through with some kind of victory. Uh, we, we all have those memories, and when it comes to the most discouraging times, it's important we hold on to those memories. It's, to it's important that we go back to those times uh, because we're all going to face discouragement now more than ever uh, in these last days. I believe we are in the last days and I believe it's getting more and more discouraging. In fact, one of the main reasons to have a meeting like this, uh, one of the main re reasons to attend a meeting and be faithful to a meeting like this is because we are lonely Bible believers <laughs> in a time where everything's going south and it's discouraging and we can see the smoke of the stories of Christianity of the past going up in the air. We can see the smoke of things we've lost that we used to have. And we could blame each other. We could blame politicians. We could blame, uh, we could blame the Illuminati. And we could blame uh, the, the rich men. And uh, we could blame these people, those people. We could blame ourselves. We could, blame, we could point the blame. Or we could just go back in memory of times God gave us a victory and claim those memories like David did and encourage ourselves in the Lord and take on the giants again. Uh, take on those uh, in, insurmountable odds because that's what they're up against. They're, they're, an army came through and did this to their town and they don't know where, which way they went. <laughs> they don't even know which way to turn. And there was, in human reasoning, there was nothing that could be done about it. Absolutely nothing. There was nothing you could do about it. It was over with in human reasoning. And so that's why they wanted to stone David. Somebody's got to pay for this. Who's going to pay for it? They were interested now in who's going to pay for this. There's got to be some kind of payment. Uh, some kind of justice. we got to somehow make this right to, just to go on living. And that was all they could come up with is, was to stone David. Uh, put the full force of the law on David. But David doesn't let that stop him. He encourages himself in the Lord. And I just, the rest of this message is going to probably go pretty quick. But uh, I just want to point out some things about when someone's encouraged in the Lord. Uh, David encouraged himself by recognizing an opportunity to exercise great faith. Not just optimism. Optimism won't get you anywhere. Positive thinking doesn't get anybody anywhere. But, but something based on some kind of substance 
uh, those uh, the times God has brought you through, he can do it again. With God, all things are possible. That's what the scripture says. All things are possible. It reminds me of one more verse quickly, Revelation chapter 2. One, one more place in the, with the idea of... Uh, I'm just going by what did, how did David encourage himself uh, before that event? He reminded himself of a lion and a bear. Now somebody could, they could have, maybe they said, uh, oh, just a boy <laughs> chasing lions and tigers and bears. Just a boy in his stories. Okay, go on, take, the, take on the giant. We'll see what happens. They, they could have been laughing about it. I don't know what they said, but I'm sure they didn't take him very seriously. David took it seriously. God delivered me from that lion, from that bear. God will deliver me from a giant, no problem. Revelation chapter 2, this even applies to churches. Uh, this is a church being spoken to, the church of Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So this church had, uh, had at one time had works in verse 2, labor, patience. They were trying those that called themselves apostles and weren't. They found them liars. Uh, they hadn't fainted in verse 3. The one thing they did is they left their first love, but the solution, the remedy to that problem was to remember something. Remember uh, from whence they were fallen to repent and do the first works. Do the first works. Go back, remember what, what it was before and go back and do that. And so it's, it's very similar to David's situation where he's uh, he is uh, encouraging himself in the Lord, I believe, by remembering how God delivered him from the lion, the bear, the giant. And God is uh, claiming the power of God as he goes forth. That's how we can encourage ourselves. In the Lord. That's how you can encourage yourself in the Lord. Look at, look at what God's already done in your life. If you're saved, you've got something to, you got something to remember. If you, if you can remember the day you got saved and trusted Christ as your Savior... And your sins were gone, and you knew it. <laughs> uh, you can go back and claim that day. God got me through that. God got me through. God gave me a victory here, a victory there. Uh, God will get me through this. Because we go through these discouragements, and uh, if there was ever a time Christians were discouraged or even talked about discouragement, it would be these modern times. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great benefit in the Christian life to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Here's a man that did it and he wasn't even saved in the born again sense like you and I are. Uh, he was uh, just a man that loved the Lord in the Old Testament and we have great advantages that David didn't have and David could encourage himself in the Lord his God just by remembering what God did for him and he could take on an army and God comes through. I think God appreciates it when we, rem when we remember the times he brought us through a great trial in the past. When we look back at what God did and, and we tell him, Lord, you did this back there. I got a problem now. I need you now. I'm just going to trust that you're going to help me now. I think God appreciates that. I think you'll see God work miracles that way. I think you'll see him come through in, in a time where he really doesn't have to. He doesn't have to go out of his way. But he will. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I wonder if we pray according to his will and we ask for some uh, wild thing to happen. Maybe it was God's will, maybe it wasn't. Maybe he's a little undecided about certain things. He doesn't have to plan everything out. Maybe some things aren't so important to him as they are to us, if you know what I mean. And uh, Moses told God to repent back there in the Old Testament. It says God repented. <laughs> Work that one out. And God changed his mind in some way. So maybe, maybe God's will is a certain thing, or maybe God's, it, does, it doesn't matter one way or another, but you pray according to his will, and you 
claim his will and you, maybe God's will changes while you're praying. I don't know how that works, but I think uh, God did something. I think God intervened once David encouraged himself in the Lord. I don't think this was all set in stone from before the foundation of the world. Uh, I, I think that's uh, nonsense theology. I think God intervenes when he sees somebody uh, with the right heart. And David's, David's heart was right instantly when he encouraged himself in the Lord. He could have easily thrown in the towel. He could have quit. And nobody would have, uh, nobody would have expected otherwise. So, okay, point number one. Point number one. Let's uh, look at verse 7 and 8. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. So this is, this is somebody that's encouraged in the Lord. And he's, in those days, they inquired at the oracles of God. They brought the, the, uh, the uh, ephod where there was the Urim and the Thummim. And they would uh, ask for the, the ephod of the, of the high priest. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord. That's how they did it in the Old Testament. David's asking the Lord something through this ephod, saying, I sh shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. You're able to find his will. Uh, somebody that's encouraged in the, in the Lord is able to find God's will. Uh, so many Christians out there looking for God's will in their life, praying for this, God, is this your will? Is this your will? Uh, what, what can I do? What do you want me to do to serve you? Uh, how can I serve you? Uh, maybe God's just waiting for you to encourage yourself in the Lord first. <laughs> and maybe you're not getting the answer of what his will is because you haven't done the, the first step, which was encourage himself in the Lord. Uh, he, when you're encouraged in the Lord, you're able to find his will. Crystal clear. Clear as a bell. And you pray and God will give you something and... And you, you know it as, as much as you know you're saved. You know you're, you're, you're supposed to do this thing. And uh, that's how God's will works sometimes. It can be very crystal clear. That's how, that's how it was for David. He gets an answer. He gets an answer. He gets some confidence. He's still looking for God's permission. He's still putting himself in a sub point, position of submission. He wasn't just, oh, I'm big and bad. I'm going to go after the enemy myself. No, he's not trusting the flesh. He's not thinking he's going to do anything to an army. He's putting himself in his right, right place and asking permission of God, even though he's encouraged. He wasn't encouraged in the flesh. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get that point across quite right, I guess, where these guys that were uh, the same guys that were discouraged going to the cave, now they see everything go up in smoke. They're encouraged in the flesh. <laughs> David was encouraged in the Lord. Those guys that wanted to stone him, they're encouraged in the flesh. You can see the difference. You can see the difference in, in, the, in the world we live in. There's, uh, there's the, 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 the division of people is happening, of where the, you got the, the, the far left, the far right, as the media calls us, and everybody's getting divided farther and farther apart, and these guys are blaming those guys. You got saved and lost on both sides. And uh, it's... Uh, it's it's not it, it's some people are being divided, people are being divided, and it's it's because they're all looking for somebody to blame, just like they looked at David. They were encouraged. Their blood was boiling. They wanted to fight. They wanted to take up arms, and they wanted to put it all against David. They thought they found an enemy. Um, isn't that like today? That's, it's it's like today. Everybody's upset. Everybody thinks that everything it should be better, and we could all say. It's gone up in smoke. Um, but they were uh, encouraged in the flesh, not encouraged in the Lord. Here's one man out of 600 that's encouraged in the Lord. And that's something. It's always a small minority. It's always that small percentage that God is uh, God's using. And as uh, Bible believers, we're, we're, uh, we don't need the great numbers. 
That's the second point. He was, you're able to find his will when you're encouraged in the Lord. You're able to, uh, you're, you're not looking for strength in numbers. Verse 9, so David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, and the 400 men and 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Besor. Uh, you're not looking for strength in numbers. In verse 16, it said that the enemy, when they finally see him down in verse 16, they're spread abroad upon all the earth. I mean, it, you couldn't even count the number of soldiers they were against, these 600 men. Uh, if you look at verse 17, they eventually chase away 400 with their 400 that went. They, David had 600, 200 stay behind. They're too faint, they're too weary, they just couldn't keep up with David in his zeal uh, moving forward. And they, they wait there, they tarry by the stuff, and uh, these 400 chase away 400. But it was a great, they were greatly outnumbered. They were greatly outnumbered. Um, you're not looking for strength in numbers. The numbers doesn't matter when you're encouraged in the Lord. So again, I'm just bringing out the point... Uh, here's, a, here's a person that's in, encouraged in the Lord, and these are the amazing things that can happen with somebody like that. What about me? What about you? Are we encouraged in the Lord? I can't say that I'm always encouraged in the Lord. I've seen God do some great things in my life. Sure, I have. I've seen, I've seen God uh, give victory when I didn't even expect it, and I can remember some times I was encouraged in the Lord, and He uh, came through just like He, just like He promised, and uh, I can look back to those times, but I'm not always I'm not always uh, on, top of, um, on top of the mountain. Here's somebody that is. And ask yourself, as we're still in the beginning of this meeting, are you encouraged in the Lord? Are you encouraged in the Lord, or are you encouraged in the flesh, or are you discouraged and uh, feeling that all hope is gone, the whole thing's hopeless, it's time to quit, uh, or maybe looking for somebody else to blame for problems in life, well, one thing's for sure, it doesn't matter with the numbers. David says, sure, go ahead, stay by the brook. We don't need, if, you, if you're, if you're going to slow us down, just sit here. It's fine. We don't need more numbers. I don't care if it's 10,000. I don't care if it's 20,000. It doesn't matter if it's 100,000 men. It said they were spread abroad upon all the earth. I don't know how many that is. That's upwards of, that's multiple thousands of men. And David's got only 600 didn't matter if he had 400. He didn't even care. He just wants to get there faster. That's amazing. <laughs> that's somebody that's encouraged in the Lord. So you say, oh, we only, had, we only had six people in church. What if it was four people in church? Does it really matter? It doesn't matter. And we have Sundays like that in Scotland. It's, a, it's the last days. What matters is that you keep going forward. What matters is that you keep sticking by the stuff. What matters is that you're encouraged in the Lord and doing it for God and not for the flesh. Uh, that's what matters. And that, that's something David understood and had no problem with. But you look at modern Christianity, they're all, they're all about the numbers. <laughs> in fact, one of the oppositions when we got to Scotland was in America, there's like, there's all these churches and stuff and it's like they're oblivious to uh, how there's still a church going culture over there where you got big churches where people don't even know why they're in church. They just know, I should be in church on Sunday. Um, but you, you, you go to Britain or Europe, I'm sure, and it's, 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 it's a little further in the past, the church-going idea. And uh, so the, we find that there's denominations of all kinds that are doing evangelistic things, and they're outreach, outreach, all these things, inviting people to come into the buildings. They're all desperate. They're all falling away. They're all, they can't get attendance. Uh, they're turning these cathedrals and kirks in Scotland into pubs and uh, apartments every day, uh, just converting them into something else because they can't keep them running. The, the Church of Scotland has a website, and they post all their properties. And I've kept an eye on it over the years. They, there used to be like four or five. Last, I just got on there like last week, and I looked. There's like 60, over 60 properties for sale church buildings in Scotland for sale. The only way the whole, that's a state funded religion, the church of Scotland, that's the state church. 
and they are so desperate that the only way they're surviving is by selling off old properties. That's how bad it is. And I'm sure you could tell me similar stories of, of uh, here in Europe, uh, but it, the, numbers still don't matter. And all the, all the carnal, contemporary, fleshy churches, they think it's all about numbers. Get them in. It doesn't matter how you get them in. Uh, put on the rock concert, play the drums, uh, offer drinks and food and everything else and popcorn and coffee shop and when you get into church. Neon lights that work. Get the people in. It doesn't matter how. And that's the, the kind of thinking that goes on. But that doesn't get the job done. That's not getting any victory for God. God's not in that. He's not a million miles from it. And it's, uh, it's a sad condition to be in. But David wasn't in that condition. Why? He wasn't encouraged in the flesh. He was encouraged in the Lord. He wasn't leaning on the arm of flesh. He was leaning on the arm of the Lord. There's a big difference. A very big difference. Uh, people look at statistics, calculations. They look at uh, pragmatism and what works, what doesn't. The end justifies the means. Uh, all that goes on today in the name of numbers. Just get people in. But that's not where strength is. David knew that's not where the strength was. I'm just pointing things out. Verse 11, it says, And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins and when he had eaten his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights and David said unto him to whom belongest thou and whence art thou and he said I am a young man of Egypt a servant to an Amalekite immediately enemy they were thinking enemy but David sees through this Notice, he says, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. Now that ought to made those same guys up in arms, blood boiling, ready to fight, ready to just unleash all the wrath of uh and revenge of their feelings and emotions upon this one man they should have stoned him like they wanted to stone david and then maybe they had the stones in hand already but here david says to him canst thou bring me down to this company and he said swear unto me by god and thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and i will bring thee down to this company and when he had brought him down behold they were spread abroad upon the upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the hand, the land of Judah. So he, uh, I'm just pointing out that he's, he's not confused who the enemy is. He's not confused who the enemy is. He could have easily blamed this guy and um, killed him there like he did in another place. Uh, the, the one that fell upon Saul. But here, he, here's a man that uh, burns, the, the, he was involved in the burning of Ziklag, but he's looking through the situation. He sees a man, he, he fell sick. He was with his master. He's just a servant. He's just doing his job. He's just part of the company. What's more important is to find the real enemy. This guy's not the real enemy. He was involved in it. He's not the real enemy. You look out there in the world and you see all the terrible things happening and our lives being taken from us and uh, just whatever it is that gets your blood going, don't be confused about who the enemy is. There's a real enemy. And it's probably not the, one, the first one that comes along. It's probably not the first one that everybody's pointing to. Uh, here's, here's a guy that admits that he's part of it, but he wasn't the real enemy. He wasn't the real enemy. Uh, he was, you're not confused about who the real enemy is when you're encouraged in the Lord. Uh, even, a, even the very elect can be deceived, but here's a guy that can't be deceived. He's encouraged in the Lord. It's important to be encouraged in the Lord. Verse 17, And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. You're willing to make a great effort. I mean, I don't know 
what else to say about that, but it's a, it'd be a great effort to uh, spend all day from the twilight even to the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. Uh, not only did he race all the way to Ziklag, he, they start hacking and swinging and fighting with those old instruments of warfare, and uh, it was a tiring, grueling, uh, difficult thing to do, and they did it all day long. They made a great effort. They had zeal. They were motivated. They had energy. They had, uh, uh, the Lord was with them. And it was, a, it was to bring about a great victory. And you're willing to make a great effort when you're encouraged in the Lord. A lot of Christians today are not willing to make much effort at all. <laughs> uh, at all, sometimes. They're just as saved as I am. And they're not willing to make a effort. It's amazing how many Christians there are out there like that. Just not willing to do anything. Why? Too much of the flesh, too much of the world, too much, uh, too much temptation and lust and things out there and just uh, distractions of life, cares of this life. Uh, just uh, too many things out there that got, got their attention. They're just not willing, not interested even. But when you're encouraged in the Lord, that's very different than being encouraged in the flesh. And it's very different than being discouraged altogether. Uh, you're willing to make a great effort, willing to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And the victory is won. Number five, you're made better in the end. It says, and David recovered all at the end of verse 19. Verse 20, and David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and David and said this is David's spoil uh, you can you can almost start to hear the joy in his verse that that voice of triumph is coming through now he's this is David's this is uh this is something to talk about um, they're they're getting the, they're getting the victory and sometimes you think back to those moments of victory in life and it's like a a golden uh, beam in the memory of you think back and it's just you can almost hear the the uh, you can almost hear the sounds of heaven <laughs> when you know God was in something in your life and and he gave, gave you a great victory it can be a joyful time but you're made better in the end he was restored he was he recovered all he said this is David's spoil they they uh, restored all that they had before and then some they got more than they had before, like Job when he went through his trial. God gives you more in the end than, he, than you had in the beginning when you're willing to go through something for God. Uh, this is an, enc an encouraged person, someone encouraged in the Lord. You'll give no attention to greed. Verse 23, Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us. I should have backed up to verse... 21 where they're, they're, this is about the 200 men that waited by the brook they were too faint too weary verse 22 they were these men of Belial evil men wanted to uh, take the spoil that they had they wanted to take their wives and their children and uh, have it for themselves what a selfish evil thing Verse 23, then said David, ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered us out of the company that came against us into our land. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward, and he made a statute for an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Um... You give no attention to greed, no attention to selfishness. There's too much of that in the church. And I said things about that last night, but, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the world we live in. Men are lovers of their own selves, and people get focused on the self, even if they don't, aren't completely in love with themselves, like the world. But he, even that attention, we get, get caught up in the selfishness of this uh, world we live in. And here's some guys, they... David wasn't, David wasn't mindful of that at all. 
He was like, that does not belong to us, and you're going to give it back to them. Uh, his judgment was right because he was encouraged in the Lord. Number seven, last point, you're able to minister a blessing and encouragement to God's people. It said in verse 26, And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil into the elders of, Israel, of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, to them which were in the south, Ramoth, to them which were in... And it goes on and tells you place names and things down to the end of the chapter. And uh, that, pretty much, that pretty much says it there. David sent of the spoil to the elders of Judah. So he had more than enough from the spoil, and he's given to others now. He has something to give to others. He's able to minister a blessing to other people. Uh, he's able to be an encouragement to other people. Why? Because he was encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. So if you have the ability to do that, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a golden thing. That's something to aim for in the Christian life. I don't know if I've got to that <laughs> ability, but I'm, I'm striving. I know somebody did, David. He encouraged himself when he met that giant. He encouraged himself when everybody wanted to stone him. And when his uh, world came crashing down on him, he knew how to encourage himself in the Lord. You look at what he did, and he looked back to the victories he had in the past, and he was able to go forward. If you can do that as a Christian, you can face anything. And uh, I hope that helps. I hope you can add to that and glean from that something. But I'm just looking at this is a man who's encouraged, who encouraged himself in the Lord. Uh, what could we be for God if we could encourage ourselves in the Lord in a discouraging world, in a discouraging life? It's just designed that way, and it's just going to be that way. Everybody's talking about it in Christianity. Everybody's discouraged. It looks like the devil's gaining ground, and the Bible says he will until the Lord comes back. <laughs> and there's going to be discouragements. If you're not in one right now, there will be a discouragement coming up, I guarantee it. And you'll have to know how to encourage yourself in the Lord. So my time's up, and uh, I'll just ask Nico to come. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dane. Um, mag ik nog een paar woorden aan toevoegen? Uh, een heel belangrijke boodschap, omdat ieder die hier is en gered is, misschien nu of anders in de toekomst of in het verleden door ontmoedigende tijden gegaan is of gaat of zal gaan. En dat is normaal als je als bijbelgetrouwe christen Jezus Christus nabocht in een wereld die door de God van deze wereld de duivel geleid wordt. En dan kan het zo zijn dat je ook als voorganger, als christen bepaalde dingen doet en die werden ook genoemd in die gemeente in Efeze in openbaring hoofdstuk 2. En er worden een paar dingen genoemd in vers 2, hoofdstuk 2, vers 2, dat de Heer Jezus zegt tot die gemeente, en dat kan ook bij u nu zo zijn, ik weet uw werken en uw arbeid en uw leidzaamheid. Dat gij de kwaad niet kunt uh, dragen. En er komen nog een aantal andere dingen die allemaal goed zijn. Die dingen, uiterlijke dingen, die zijn goed. Dat kan ook met u zo zijn. Die kunnen allemaal kloppen. Maar... Het kan al zo zijn dat Egypte, de wereld, een beetje in het hart gekomen is. Dat je die dingen doet, niet meer vanuit het hart, maar omdat het nu één keer zo hoort. Vanuit een gewoonte, vanuit een traditie. En als we dat vergelijken, wat in hoofdstuk 2 vers 2 staat, en dat vergelijkt met een hele jonge gemeente, die de eerste liefde nog had in de eerste gemeente in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonicense hoofdstuk 2 vers 2. Pardon, hoofdstuk 1, vers 3, dan zien we daar staan dezelfde woorden, het werk, eh, arbeid en verdraagzaamheid, maar er wordt een woordje bij ieder aan toegevoegd. In 1 Thessalonicense 1, vers 3 lezen we daar het werk, uw geloofs, dat was er niet meer bij, bij die gemeente in Efeze. De arbeid der liefde en de verdraagzaamheid... Der hoop. Dan hebben we die beroemde geloof, hoop en liefde. Eén keer in de dertiende. En de meeste van deze 
Of de grootste van deze is de liefde. En de liefde van Christus die dient ons te dringen. Om voor hem iets te doen. Om als voorganger, zendeling, uh, uh, wat dan ook, een zegen te zijn voor de Heer. En als die eerste liefde er niet meer is, omdat hij... Ik heb geen tijd met de Heer gehad, dus was een bekende zonde, de wereldsgezindheid, te, te veel op het internet of wat dan ook. Dan is het allemaal een sleur geworden, een moeten geworden. En daar kun je als christen heden ten dagen heel snel in vervallen. En dan merk je soms, zoals bij David, uh, dat je een... Uh, David heeft ook een paar fouten gemaakt. Hè? Hij, was, uh, hij maakte compromissen, hij ging naar Ages, had helemaal niet naar Ages moeten gaan, hulp zoeken bij een... Filistijnse koning, en toen was hij er één keer beland en moest hij ook nog vechten met zijn soldaten tegen het, zijn eigen mensen. Dat had hij nooit moeten doen. Hij had zich verlaten op wereldgezinde christenen, zou ik kunnen zeggen, of vijanden van het kruis. En als je dat doet, dan verlies je de kracht die God je heeft gegeven. De kracht die God je geeft ligt in de afzondering, in de tijd met Hem, niet in getallen. Dat is nooit zo geweest. Als je een grote kerk wil hebben, dan moet je katholiek worden. Dan heb je een miljard medegeloofsheidenen. Uh, dat is alles wat ze zijn, heidenen. Uh, en ik heb een jaar gelezen, een, een oude broeder die zei tegen mij... Oh. Als je uh, uh, mensen wil trekken met entertainment, vergeet dan niet dat je ze alleen maar met entertainment kunt houden. Dat is zo. Als je ze wint door het evangelie te preken, dat is de kracht van God. En die is te voeden met het woord van God. En die je relatie met de Heer goed te houden. En het is altijd een minderheid geweest. Uh, de Gideons Gang, hij begon met uh, 32.000 man geloof ik. En dan, huh, dan heb je daar, je kent die, uh, die Hells Angels jongens, dat is de 1%ers. Uh, 1%ers, sorry dan. Nou ja, Gideons Gang was een 1%er. Na 32.000 man had de Heer gezegd, nou ja, twee schriftingen, 300 over. Ah, daar had nog 1% over. En hij moest al vechten met 20.000 man tegen 120.000 man. Ze had gedacht, gedacht zo, nou, 1 tegen 4. En dan had hij 1% over, 99%, die was te laf of te lui. Die kon hij wegdoen. Die waren niet getraind. Dus hij moest met 300 man tegen 120.000 midden niet te strijden. En de heer zegt, weet je waarom de heer dat doet? Weet je waarom de heer niet zoveel mensen misschien geeft in de gemeente? Dat als de heer iets doet of als er iets gebeurt... En weet je, het is de genade en de kracht van de Heer. En ik kan u nooit zeggen, het is op grond van mijn geweldige prediking of persoonlijk zie winnen. Uh, <laughs> Soms ben je omringd door vijanden. Jesse Poever zei ooit eens een keer, uh, de meest bekende marine in de geschiedenis van de Verenigde Staten. Toen werd hij opgebeld, ja, waar, zijn, waar is de vijand? Nou zei Poever, ik zal mij van de lijn geven. <laughs> Weet je nog, van die lijnen, hè, die landlines. Um, en die Marietje zei dan, dan, ja, we zijn omringd. Nou, zei Poel al, geweldig, dan kan de vijand ons niet ontvluchten. Dan kunnen we aan elk kant aanvallen, dan hebben we al het vijanden die we kunnen verslaan. Dat is moraal. Moraal is zeker meer dan de helft van de slagkracht van een gemeente of een leger. En uh, ik wil nog uh, een paar dingen over zeggen. Wat heel belangrijk is, is als je um, in een kleine groep bent, dat je altijd het initiatief houdt. Altijd. Als je het initiatief verliest in de tijd van ontmoediging, dan kan je zo weggevaagd worden. Uh, kom naar 2 Samen hoofdstuk 10 als voorbeeld. Dat is een hele belangrijke boodschap. 2 Samen hoofdstuk 10. Vers 9 tot en met 14. Het is een situatie als de Syriërs en de Ammonieten samen zweren om... Israël te vernietigen. Je kan het hele tijd vergelijken met uh, verschillende moslimgroepen die uh, in het Midden-Oosten Israël de zee in willen drijven. Hè? Van de rivier tot de zee heb je die slogan dan. En hier zie je een voorbeeld hoe uh, toen de tijd het, de overste van het leger van Israël gehandeld heeft. Vers 9 van 2 Samen hoofdstuk 10. Toen Joop zag dat de spits de slagorde tegen hem was, van voren en van achteren, zo verkoos hij uit alle uitgelezenen van Israël en stelde hen in de orde tegen de Syriërs aan. Het overige des volks gaf hij onder de hand van zijn broeder Abizai, die in het, het in orde stelde tegen de kinderen Ammons aan. En hij zei, zo de Syriërs mij te sterk zullen zijn, zo zult gij mij komen verlossen, 
Zo de kinderen Ammon zitten sterk zullen zijn, zo zal ik komen om u te verlossen. En een vers om te, uit je hoofd te leren. Wees sterk en laat ons sterk zijn voor ons volk en voor de steden onze schots. De Heere, nu doe wat goed is in zijn ogen. Nu ze moesten sterk zijn. Zien ze zich te bemoedigen. Hoe deed hij dat? Vers 13. Toen naderde Joab en het volk dat bij hem was, dus de ene helft van het leger, tot de strijd tegen de Syriërs. Dus je ziet hier, ze zijn omringd. En het laatste wat een minderheid verwacht wordt te doen, het initiatief nemen en aanvallen. Dat is precies wat hij doet. Ze nemen het initiatief en ze vallen een grote meerderheid aan. Wat gebeurt er? Einde van vers 13. En zij, dat zijn de Syriërs, vloden voor zijn aangezicht. Wat is het punt? Het punt is angst. De God van deze wereld wordt genoemd de koning des verschrikkens in het boek Job. En weet je hoe hij je probeert te ontmoedigen? De angst. Intimidatie. Hij is de perfecte intimidator. Vers 14, als de kinderen Ammon zagen dat de Syriërs vloden, vloden ze ook voor het aangezicht van Nabisi en kwamen in de stad. En Job keerde weder van de kinderen Ammon en kwam naar Jeruzalem. Dus de ene groep vluchten, zegt de andere allemaal, ja, dan moeten wij alleen vechten tegen een leger wat één vijand heeft. Twee verontwoordigers weg, dan vluchten wij ook. Dus ze hebben zijn initiatief genomen en ze hebben de oorlog zo gewonnen. Dat is waarom de Heer in het Nieuwe Testament zegt, ga heen en predik, ga heen en leer, ga heen en getuig, ga heen en zijn mijn getuigen. Het handeling is altijd gaan, getuigen, dan komt er verdrukking, gemeente ontstaan en dan ga je verder. En het hele idee ten dagen is, velen worden ontmoedigd, maar ze worden passief. Daarom is straatprediking zo belangrijk, of getuigen, je het initiatief neemt. En als je dat gaat verliezen, dan krijg je gegarandeerd problemen in je persoonlijk leven of in je gemeenteleven. We hopen morgen ook de straat op te gaan, voor ik het vergeet, dus mocht u plannen maken, ik zou willen voorstellen dan dat op donderdagmiddag, vrijdagmiddag te doen, maar dat we morgen die tijd kunnen nemen, als u wil althans, om mee te gaan naar Leeuwarden, om het evangelie van de genade van God te brengen. En het laatste wat ik nog graag wil uh, meegeven aan u, is uh, hoe David heel eerlijk is in het verdelen van de buit. Hij is niet uh, iemand die uh, op zijn geld zit, zeg maar maar in het Nederlands. In 1 Samuel hoofdstuk 30 vers 24, dan zien we dat die 600 man onderverdeeld worden in een groep van 200, die kan niet verder. Die 400 die sterk zijn, die trekken verder en die verslaan die Amalekieten en die brengen de hele buit terug. En dan zeggen die 400, nou ja, voor de extra buit, wat we dat doen, die tilden krijgen van vrouwen en kinderen terug, maar verder krijgen ze helemaal niks. En wij, 400, verdelen dat hele extra onder onszelf. En die 400 krijgen niks, dus ze krijgen een derde meer, zou je kunnen zeggen, per man, als dat ze anders zouden krijgen als iedereen gelijk verdeeld zou worden. En dan zegt David in vers 24 van 1 Samuel 30, wie zou toch u lieden in deze zaak horen? Want gelijk het deel degene is die in de strijd mede afgetogen zijn, alzo zal ook het deel degene zijn die bij het gereedschap gebleven zijn. Ze zullen gelijkelijk delen. Dat is een heel belangrijk principe voor bijvoorbeeld uh, mensen die als mannen de straat op gaan en het evangelie brengen en zien die winnen. Gewoon wat de Heer dan zegt, je vrouw die niet altijd mee kan gaan, niet kan gaan, die, die, die bidden bij de kinderen te blijven, wat dan ook, die zal gelijk met jou delen. Als je een gemeente hebt, en er zijn er altijd een paar die graag de straat op gaan, dat is ook goed. Er hebben wel een aantal mensen die kunnen niet, of die willen niet, of wat dan, die zeggen, nou ik bid liever. Dan zegt hij, oké, okay, dan zul je gelijk delen. Bidden is net zo belangrijk als uiterlijk gaan. De ene die gaat in de geest, de ander die gaat fysiek. Toen wij vorig jaar naar Schotland zijn geweest, kwamen er een paar mensen tot geloof. Een paar tientallen geloof, dat is fantastisch. Maar het is onder andere omdat er heel veel mensen gebeden hebben voor en tijdens ons spreek. En wij konden dan de frontlinie preken en oogsten. We zullen gelijk delen, zegt hij. Belangrijk bij een gemeente. Ieder doet zijn deel. Want het is heel belangrijk dat je een, een gemeente vraagt, heer, wat is de plaats die u mij geeft in een plaatselijke gemeente. Als uh, vrouw van een, van een predikant, diaken, uh, straatprediker. Ieder heeft zijn plaats. Maar het belangrijk is dat je je plaats weet... Dat je daar je best geeft als een trouwe lid van de plaatselijke gemeente. En dan gaat de Heer op zijn manier wel zijn zegen geven en uiteindelijk ook zijn beloning geven. Laten we nog bidden. Vader, dank u nogmaals voor uw woord. Wilt u ons genade schenken om in de Heer bemoedigd te blijven. Op u te zien de uh, beginner, de volleinder en uh, van ons geloof. 
En dank u voor een man als David, die ook in dit opzicht een voorbeeld is geweest voor ons. En bovenal voor uw zoon, de Heer Jezus Christus, die altijd op u heeft geschat, alles van u heeft verwacht. En u heeft het ook beloond door hem uit de doden op te dekken. En we vragen u dat het geloof wat u door uw zoon aan ons gegeven heeft, dat we het ook mogen doortrekken en trouw mogen zijn. Die navolging van uw zoon, uh, totdat u komt, Heer Jezus, om ons thuis te halen. Dat vragen we u in zijn naam. Amen. Oké, okay, laten we een korte pauze nemen en daarna komt de volgende spreker. En de jeugd die kan nu met Glenn meegaan naar achter. Yeah. 